5. That's cents, years, and percent. On average, women worldwide earn 63 cents for every dollar a man earns. It will take 202 years to close that pay gap, and just 5% of Fortune 500 chief executives are women. What accounts for persistent workplace inequality, and what is at stake for our economies? If you take a look at the economy today, if women hadn't made the progress that they've made in terms of increasing labor force participation, deepening their uh, commitment to the labor force, their work hours, our GDP would be $2 trillion smaller today. So that puts the big sort of stakes on the line. We know that women are contributing a lot and making sure that all people can reach their full potential is what's going to allow us to reach our full potential as a society. You know, one of the reasons why labor force participation is important is because it gives them that independence that means that they can make decisions over their life to financially support themselves. So, uh, if, you know, they're in a marriage that isn't working out, they have the ability to leave. So early on in my research, I showed that in the United States, when divorce laws changed in a way that meant that uh, husbands could leave marriages without getting consent from their wives when we moved to the no-fault divorce regime. We saw a lot more women participating in the labor force. Why do they participate in the labor force more? Well, it's an insurance policy. You know, you're still going to have some marketable skills. I think that a lot of the base level uh, considerations that account for the gender pay gap, like access to education, we're doing a lot better on. The evidence suggests that in the global north, we've reduced the gap to about 15%. This is by no means to say, say that it is acceptable, but I think the problem uh, lies in the issue of motherhood. Motherhood imposes a penalty that fatherhood typically does not. Women disproportionately must either opt for occupations that give them flexibility or put off promotions and career advancement. And the persistence of the structural obstacles in the workplace that underlie this choice highlights just how sticky cultural norms about motherhood are. Let's just start with the facts, which is that there's a huge penalty for motherhood. So the way that wages work over our lifetime is not surprisingly to anybody. They start low in your 20s and they rise over time. What happens when you have a baby? That climb, that upward trend in earnings flattens out. So you sort of hit your peak and you're no longer, you're treading water. So I think why it happens is we have a labor force that is very unforgiving when people take time off the no, particularly for higher wage, higher skilled workers, what's happening for women is they, they, they sideline their career a little bit when they first have kids. And we don't have a labor market that makes it really easy to get back on sort of that super highway to promotions once your kids get back in school. And I think if you take a look at a lot of women when they have young kids, here's the sad reality, they pay to work. By the time they pay for the childcare, the cost of commuting, uh, the cost of takeout dinners when they can't make it home in time to cook, um, the costs associated with getting, you know, preparing themselves for working, you know, they, they take a look at what they have left, there's pennies left over, and they might say, should I stay home? So this is how I see the problem. Economists have a concept called public goods. Public goods are goods that are costly for a private party to manufacture or make, uh, but that have huge benefits to society. Assuming that we think that human life is good, there could be no more paradigmatic instance of this than children. Um, one of the things that markets are very bad at dealing with is public goods and rewarding private actors that are pr producing these public goods essentially uh, through market mechanisms. This is a well-known market failure uh, and this is something that uh, in the case of motherhood I think needs to be analysed very clearly through this lens. 
27% of women never come back to work after having kids. 40% of women take significant amounts of time off. And when I say significant amounts of time, it's typically 12 or more times that of fathers. And so the average woman will take 12 weeks off. Many women take a lot more time off. Whereas men are taking one week off. Um, this seems to me very, very strange. And it seems to me uh, to be a dimension of, of socialization as much as market forces. Uh, and also something that we've seen that remedies exist for. We can't really have women and men actively participating in the labor force and no infrastructure there to support working families. What we're seeing in the United States is this youngest generation in the workforce is increasingly saying, I'm just gonna keep focusing on my career and I'm not gonna have the children that I'd like to have, but I don't have the infrastructure to support, and so I'm gonna postpone and postpone and postpone. And maybe we'll see a big wave of fertility in the late 30s, early 40s for that cohort, or maybe we'll see that at the end of the day they have fewer kids on average. Actually, um, in some professions, um, men enjoy a boost in promotion and pay of, as they become fathers because they're seen as you know, more responsible and they need that breadwinner um, wage. However, there's certainly lots of other ways in which women face barriers in the workplace, even independent of motherhood, and women who never have children will face those barriers as well. The motherhood penalty, at least in the U.S., has remained unchanged for nearly 30 years. But what has changed is women, who now make up the majority of college graduates and comprise nearly half of the labor force. Despite these gains, women continue to face barriers to career advancement. We've talked a lot about the motherhood penalty and the direct economic impacts that women suffer when they do have children. But I think that there is a stigma attached also to not having children. Um, so it, I think it, it's a sort of no-win situation, whichever, whichever direction you go in. What goes into making top-level leaders of corporations or universities or nations is not just one's work day or work week, but one's capacity to lead a full life. And I think that um, men just assume that they will be able to have fulfilled professional and personal lives that will sort of support each other. And the fact that women are confronted with this very stark choice is deeply, deeply unfair. We just have old-fashioned notions of what a career track looks like, and those old-fashioned notions are centered around men. So we have to rethink, what does a career look like? So how did we get to that place? Well, it was built for men, but importantly, it was also built for much, much, much shorter life expectancy. So nowadays, people are you know, living much longer. We've had this great increase in life expectancy. And even though there are lots of workers who still think, you know, I'm going to retire in my 60s, particularly for high, highly educated workers, they're like, well, my job's not that bad. It's actually kind of interesting. And so you see people working for even longer. So if we think about what's the trajectory left after you turn 40, so much you still got 30 years of work in front of you, 30 years to build a career. And yet we don't have a way for women to come in at you know, 40, 45 and say, I am here and I've got a lot to like deliver. If we can't figure out how to get them back on the fast track, you know, after a five to 10 year slow period, then we're really gonna miss out on a lot of talent. I faced enormous challenges. Um, and the more prominent is the work and the more attention it commands, the more um, difficult it is for men to accept women. Even the word ambition, which means that you're trying to get ahead, is considered to be a bad word for women and is considered to be very positive for men. So when an attempt to make things better is considered to be a problem and used against you, you can imagine 
when you are a CEO, what the response will be. So this is a part of the labor market that is being more discussed, and that's climate and discrimination. Once they get the training, so there was a lot of uh, a lot of discussion about how to incorporate women into the labor force by educating them, sort of making sure they have a certain type of education. Okay, so we're getting that type of education. So we've done that part. We've done the supply part. It's the climate part that is the problem. That's why the workers at Google were protesting. What is sad is that for a long time, female leaders felt that they needed to be as masculine as possible to be taken seriously. So, you know, Margaret Thatcher, for instance. Um, but even with the Hillary Clinton uh, loss in the uh, presidential run, um, which was tragic for, for women all over the world, I think it was the fact that there was an element of inauthenticity there, that she was needing to parade as, as masculine or, you know, display characteristics that perhaps were not innate, and by that I, I don't mean that, you know, that they're not innate to any women, but I, I think that femininity and power should be able to coexist. Uh, and it's fantastic that we're seeing more women who are finding ways of being both what would traditionally be considered feminine and also deeply powerful. After 102 women were elected or re-elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in the 2018 midterm elections, many were calling it the Year of the Woman. And there are signs that this may have been a turning point for gender equality in the workplace and the economy. I was giving a presentation earlier today and I was talking about Procter & Gamble's Fight Like a Girl slogan, um, which I think is, is, a, is a positive sign. And Procter & Gamble, uh, uh, apparently in their sort of top level hiring, are now using uh, female leadership traits as paradigmatic and, and requiring, and, and just not, not just recruiting women, but recruiting senior men that they appoint to those positions to embody some of, uh, some of those characteristics. We have a lot of evidence of what women have been able to achieve in a very short space of time in various different realms. Uh, it's actually on our ideas and our notions uh, and, and the stereotyping of the genders that is lagging behind progress that is already happening on the ground. I think that social media has been democratizing. Um, I think that women's voices may have been marginalized in the past, but I think that their uh, being on, uh, and I say social media because I don't know of another period where the voices have been uh, so augmented, but this is them augmenting themselves. Now, there's a lot of harassment online too. Absolutely, absolutely. But I would say that marginalized voices are often augmented by this platform and that they can reach across uh, countries, they can reach across groups to form alliances, say through Facebook or through Twitter, and organize their efforts. And I think this has been empowering in that way. At the same time, I actually think it's even more important that we shift our culture to be one in which caregiving is valued, whether that's you know men or women taking care of their children at home, or whether that's teachers and child care workers who need to be paid well and you know and get good benefits in their workplaces. I think part of the way we change it is through workplace action. I mean in the United States and worldwide you're seeing women public sector workers, many of whom are care workers, especially teachers, child care workers. We're seeing them go on strike and demand better conditions. Few would deny that significant progress toward equality has been made since women started pouring into the workforce two generations ago. But much work remains. What does the future hold? You can't make people ignorant after they know these things are happening. And information travels so quickly. It travels so quickly. This was critical for the civil rights movement. It was absolutely critical to expose that the civil rights people were being attacked with dogs, that the protesters were being, their lives were being put in jeopardy. So everybody knew that. I think that our memories are somehow 
not tied enough. There's not a collective memory. We need historians to keep reminding us of what our history was and what we went through. I think everything moves in cycles. So I think we push very far on women's rights, for example, and we get some. We push very far on, uh, on human rights, on civil rights, and we get very far and then we push back. So I think that we're in a, uh, in a period of inflection, of change. And I don't know which one is going to be the next cycle because we've had a lot of change. Let's say, for example, with respect to gay rights, with respect to um, uh, same-sex marriage. Those attitudes changed in a very short period of time. There is discrimination. There is hostility. There is aggression. There are attacks, sexual attacks, etc. Are they going to go away? I don't think so. So the question is to build a society in which people can flourish and be protected against them. Is that possible? I think it is. I'm certainly hoping, you know, that as a society we're um, moving um, in that direction against the sort of neoliberal principles of putting corporate profits first and toward investing in people that, um, that I think um, it has been um, proven to, um, um, to um, open up opportunities for women and um, reduce discrimination. You know, nobody can predict the future, but I have a lot of optimism that today's women are stronger, they're better trained, and they're gonna take us to a much better place.